And today's scripture is, is very fitting because it talks about Jesus' teaching. And what happened back in Jesus' day? We had the Pharisees who believed in a resurrection. Now, they had some other problems because they thought Jesus, they thought God would be happy if people followed every kind of rule. And Jesus is saying, no, look at the heart. And then they had the Sadducees, which were like the leadership, the political and religious leadership. And they said, the only one we'll ever listen to is Moses. We don't care about the Psalms. We don't care about the prophets. We only care about what Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then they said, and when you die, that's it. You're buried and you're gone. That's it. Nothing more. Now, they decided to approach Jesus and show Jesus that they were right and that Jesus was wrong. And it came out with a masterful, masterful joke. There's a lot of humor in these scriptures. And these Sadducees can hardly keep a straight face. They got Jesus nailed. They're going to get him. And they're coming up. And, and they approach him with some trickery. They'll say, teacher, as if they would listen to him at all. And, but they're giving him a compliment like teacher. Now they're setting it up. And now they're going to find the proof that there's no life after death. And they come back to an ancient law, Israeli law, and the law meant this, that the firstborn son had to have a male heir to carry on the name. And if that son died, uh, his widow had to, the next son had to marry that widow, and the first boy would be named after the first son who died. And that would carry on the first son's name. That is just very, very important to them. And so here comes their joke, and they're kind of smirking. The ones behind, in the background are really kind of chuckling, and they said, Teacher, say there's a woman married to this guy, and he dies. And so the brother marries the widow to carry on that line, and he dies. Now the next brother, and they're really smirking now, they're kind of chuckling, they're trying to keep a straight face, and he dies, and all the way through seven brothers, they all die, but they all married her. Now Jesus, ho, 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 whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And they just think that's gloriously funny. And Jesus says, you believe in Moses. Yes, we do. You believe in what Moses said and taught. Yes, we do. But you don't. Don't you remember in Exodus chapter 3 that when Moses approached the burning bush that wouldn't go out, there's a fire, he takes off his shoes, it's holy ground, and what does God say to Moses? Well, and Jesus tells them, God said, I am the God of Abraham. Now, Abraham's been dead for over 500 years. Notice the present tense. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac, his son. I am the God of Jacob. It's all present tense. And Jesus looks him in the eye and says, God is not the God of the dead. God's the God of the living. And all are alive before God. And they are stunned. Had Jesus quoted a prophet, they wouldn't have believed it. Only the five books of Moses was, would be their scripture. And they are stunned. And that's Jesus' teaching. Now, I want to share with you uh, some reflections being a minister for 43 years, being a preacher's kid. Uh, one time my dad I was talking to my dad, and uh, he had been by this, uh, the, the bedside of a person dying. And the person said, I see so-and-so who was dead, and I see so-and-so who was dead, and I see so-and-so, and the family goes, what? He's alive. Cousin so-and-so is still alive. They're kind of puzzled. The guy dies. Later on they find out, 
cousin died. They just hadn't got word yet. So that you, sometimes you'll come across uh, uh, pieces like this. But the point is this. What we have is faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus. And when my dad had contracted leukemia, and he was in a Philadelphia hospital, his lungs were filling up with pneumonia, and as he was dying, he quotes Psalm 100. Now, being a Christian means you can live a certain way, but it also means you die a certain way. And he was quoting Psalm 100. He knew it was the end. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. We are his sheep, the sheep of his pasture. And here's the key. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. So what's the possibility when we leave this earth? We could enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, giving thanks to him. And so the possibility for us is that we know that Jesus wants us to have a life to receive love. By faith, we believe it in our minds. But then it goes to our hearts. And as it touches our hearts, then we start getting the love and the joy and the peace showing up in our lives. And that's a beautiful life. Eternal life means it's a quality of life of God on this earth and the also the life to come. Now, I believe, and, and the Bible teaches that when we die, we come to Jesus. And the first proof I want to give you is from the book of Acts, and this is uh, written by Dr. Luke, chapter 7. And in the book of Acts, Stephen is a deacon, and he's been preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and they don't like it. The authorities want him killed. And they have a spot where they kill you. And they kill you by throwing these really big rocks at you. And as Stephen's being hit with these big rocks, as he's dying, he says this. He looks into heaven. He says he gazed, this is from uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 55. But full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing. Now here's the key. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he says, look, behold, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And what is Jesus doing? Why would he stand up? He's going to welcome Stephen. He's going to welcome Stephen into God's heaven. Now, St. Paul who was there, he was holding the coats for the guys doing the stoning. He has his conversion experience, but in his spiritual outlook, I want to show what he teaches. And from his second letter to the church, the Greek church of Corinth, he says this. He says, we're of good courage always, reading from the fifth chapter. We know that while we're home in the body, we are away physically from the Lord, the Spirit's with us, but we're we're away from the Lord at home in the body. For we live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would, now listen carefully, we would rather be away from the body and home with the Lord. Now what does that mean? It means when we die, we're home with the Lord. So whether we are at home, here in the body, or away in heaven with Jesus, we make it our aim to please him. In other words, while we have life and breath, our job is to please Jesus. What does he want? He wants us to love God. He wants us to love each other by choosing it, agape, choosing love, and that way we show our love back to God. So we please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or or evil. Now, he goes on to say to his letter to the Philippians, the church in Philippi, he has another important teaching here. And it's really the same thing. Chapter 1, verse 20, the 24. And this is what he says. 
as it was my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but full of courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body. So he knows he's under a lot of attack, but he wants Christ to be honored by how he lives, whether by life or death. In other words, if I, li- if I live, I'm serving. If I die by Nero, I'm a martyr. If I want to be pleasing to Christ, if I am to live in the flesh, well, first of all, he says, a wonderful verse, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. What's the gain for him? If he's a martyr, he gets to be with Jesus. For I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. That means I can give God's love to others. And he goes on to say, and then he says, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart, that's to be killed as a martyr, and to be with Christ. He doesn't say, I'll go into sleep. No, I'm going to be with Christ. For that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your account. So what is he saying? He says, I need to be here for you. I need to teach you, to encourage you, to help you. And why we live, that's our job. To, be a ble- to receive blessings, to give a blessing. To receive Jesus' love, to give Jesus' love in a wise way. That's what we're called to do. But when we die, Paul is teaching, we go to be with Jesus. Now in the upper room, there in Jerusalem, when Jesus shared the bread and the cup, he said this, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. You know, could we do it? That's the definition of a Christian. Can you believe in Jesus? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. So heaven's a relationship for Jesus. And my dad took that scripture for his very last sermon. When he had that leukemia, he gave one last talk, and he was on radio to uh, Chester County in Pennsylvania, and on short wave to his missionaries in the Philippines or South America. And he said this, his last sermon was, Heaven, a prepared place, that's what Jesus said, for prepared people. How do we prepare? Putting our trust and faith in Jesus. Well, I'd like to close with a passage that St. Paul says. This is at the end of his life. Nero's going to get him. You remember, Caesar Nero was pretty tough. And he said this, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Right now he's in chains in jail. And the time of my departure has come. It's here. Nero's going to get him. I fought the good fight. What's the next thing he says? I finished the race. Now this is a key. Can we finish the race? Can we keep on keeping on? No matter what obstacles we face, with our trust in Jesus, with love in our hearts, receiving the love and giving the love, can we finish the race? And he said, I kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, here's a word for you, but to all who loved Jesus appearing. You love Jesus? That's, that's his criteria. That's the crown. And finally, in the book of Revelation, there's a wonderful passage. And in the Revelation, it's a passage where the elders, there's 24 elders gathered around a glassy sea. And they all have a crown. They're the 24 key leaders. I don't know who they are. They might be the apostles and other key people. Maybe it's Mother Teresa. I don't know. Maybe people we never heard of. And what do they do? They take their crowns off. Well, we just got a crown in Timothy. They take it off and they slide it over that glassy sea, that crystal sea, back to Jesus. So my interpretation is in heaven, you know, there's rewards, there's acknowledgement. You all serve so well. But in the end, we take our reward, we give it all back to our Lord who loved us so much.